Yesterday on this show, I said Sauce Gardner is undeniably the best quarterback in this year's draft. That's after NFL Network's Good Morning Football selected LSU cornerback Derek Stingley Jr. ahead of Sauce Gardner in their mock draft. Is there some debate to this? Well, I thought, what better guest to have on than the host of Locked On LSU, Caroline Fenton? We'll settle this on today's episode. Plus, I'll ask her about Corey Kiner, Brian Kelly. Yes, I'm going to ask her about Brian Kelly. And a certain quarterback who Desmond Ritter compared himself to that, Caroline, you're very familiar with. It's all coming up on Locked On Bearcats. Our Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. It's free and available everywhere you get your podcast. If you're watching on the Lockdown Bearcats YouTube channel, don't forget to subscribe. You can also like and share a comment on this video. If you're downloading from audio, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast, don't forget to like, share, comment, and give it a rating. All of that helps more Bearcats fans like you find this podcast. If you're wondering why I'm wearing these I don't know what you call fancy, shiesty shades, whatever. Joe Shiesty Uh, Shades. Yes, it's because my guest today, uh, she's been on before. She's a friend of the show, loved having her on. So I thought, you know what, let's have her on again because there's a debate that I heard last week on Good Morning Football. And I'm like, what? All right. She's the host of Locked On LSU. She's an LSU alum. She's currently also a Nashville sports talk show host. She's the co-host of Stillman & Company on ESPN 1025 The Game, Nashville's best sports talk. Their, Their show was great. Caroline Fenton joins me once again, and I first got to ask you, is there like some secret road passageway, maybe it's called I-9, maybe it's called I-Gumbo Chili, Cajun Chili, that keeps sending all these players from Baton Rouge to Cincinnati? Is there something to this, Caroline? Is there something I'm not seeing? See, I was actually having this conversation with someone last week. I was like, I don't know what it is about two schools, Cincinnati and just the city of Cincinnati as a whole, and Notre Dame. That LSU just cannot get rid of. That there's just this constant relationship between the two of both, you know, with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase playing for the Bengals, whether it be Corey Kiner transferring to Cincinnati, and of course the obvious connection between Brian Kelly and LSU and Notre Dame. I just and and then Coach O talking to a Notre Dame practice a few weeks ago. It just felt like between those two schools and the city of Cincinnati as a whole, LSU just can't get them off their back. I mean, I mean, this is so crazy. It's like the Bengals used to have this relationship with the Bills. The Reds have a relationship with the San Francisco Giants. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just so weird, these connections that we see in both college and professional sports. So, Derek Stingley Jr., chosen ahead of Sauce Gardner in NFL Network's Good Morning Football's mock draft last week. I, Caroline, no offense to you and your school, that rubbed me the wrong way because I think Sauce Gardner is undeniably the best corner in this year's draft. But is there a debate to this? Is there a reason maybe that Derek Stingley Jr. could be taken ahead of Sauce Gardner? Is it even possible that this could happen? So I think a couple different questions there that I think all have a different answer. Um, who is the better cornerback? And this is not a, a homer take at all. And of course, I have not. I haven't watched nearly as much Cincinnati football as I have watched Derek Stingley football or LSU football as a whole. Um, Derek Stingley is the best college cornerback I have ever seen. And in 2019, he had the type of season as a true freshman that if he would have come into the NFL draft that following year, he would have been taken top 10 first cornerback overall. And that I don't feel like that's a hot take by any means. I think that's pretty grounded on just what Derek Stingley Jr. was able to do as a true freshman. Derek Stingley just has like some uncoachables attached to him. And I hate that word. I feel like it's a buzzword, but just... Derek Stingley has the perfect size. He has the perfect length. He has the perfect hand size. And he just has this inherent ability of knowing where a a receiver is going before a receiver even knows where he's going. Derek Stingley Jr. is an absolute ball hawk. I would say that if you're looking for some sort of prototype for a corner, a college corner, Derek Stingley in 2019 is that. 
But you asked, do you think that Derek Stanley could be taken above Sauce Gardner? Could he be the first cornerback taken? All of that, those good accolades that I have to say about Derek Stingley, I don't, I, I, if, I'm, if I'm a betting woman, I wouldn't bet that Derek Stingley is taken over Sauce Gardner just because I'm talking about Derek Stingley and what he was doing in 2019. Sauce Gardner is an incredibly talented corner that did it in 2021. I think that Derek Stingley, if he wasn't, if he didn't go through an injury, and if 2019 was his final season in college football, it wouldn't even be a debate that Derek Stingley would be taken over Sauce Gardner. However, Sauce Gardner has been able to do it this past season. Sauce Gardner's not coming off of an injury. I mean, Sauce Gardner, I mean, what? He is a ball hawk as well. He's an incredibly talented cornerback. But I think if you just, if I'm an NFL general manager and I'm picking for the future of my franchise and I need a corner that's able to contribute immediately right now, which is what you expect out of your first round pick, I'm taking Sauce Gardner just because of the question marks that are there with Derek Stingley, the fact that he hasn't been able to reproduce his 2019 production over the past couple of years, and the fact that he's only played in a handful of games over the past two seasons. That's just too many question marks for me with Derek Stingley. And Sauce Gardner has has a very is very, very close in terms of ability, and he's been able to do it, and your best ability is availability, and Sauce Gardner has been available. Are you saying then that Derek Stingley, if you put his injuries aside, is a better cornerback than Sauce Gardner? Um, that's tough because I'm comparing a 2019 season to a 2021 season. But I think that Derek Stingley had a – like if you're, you're going to compare their best two seasons in college, 2019 for Derek Stingley, 2021 for Sauce Gardner, Derek Stingley had a better season in 2019. The, I, like I was looking at both of their draft profiles, and you look at the pros and cons of each of them. They both have very similar pros. Um, you know, just what they're able to do it speaks for itself. And if you look at the cons for Derek Stingley, it's really just lack of consistency over the past couple of years, injury concerns. If you look at at Sauce Gardner, according to NFL.com, his cons for the draft, it's, you know, his size. He can draw a lot of penalties. He can be kind of sloppy at times. So it's technically and physically, Derek Stingley is better. But Sauce Gardner is just more of a short thing. And I say Derek Stingley is better. It's by incredibly slim margins. You look at Derek Stingley's 2019, he had 38 total, tackle, total tackles in 2019. Sauce Gardner had 40 in 2021. You look at, at interceptions. Derek Stingley had six. Sauce Gardner had three. Derek Stingley had 15 passes deflected in, in 2019. Sauce Gardner had four. So it's incredibly slim margins, statistically at least. But I just think that, you know, Sauce Gardner being more of a sure thing, seems like he would be the first cornerback taken over Derek Stingley. But in terms of ability and what we've seen in the past, Derek Stingley has been more impressive. So you mentioned some things that make Stingley better than Sauce Gardner. You mentioned the statistics. You also, what else is there? that I'm not seeing, because I will agree with you. Sauce Gardner can commit too many penalties. Mm-hmm. He is he is sloppy at times, even though, and I'm not sure, Caroline, if you know this, Car- um, Sauce Gardner did not allow a 20-yard reception last year. Not one 20-yard reception. That, to me, is significant. And I'm sure you saw J- him go up against Jamison Williams of Alabama yeah. in the Cotton Bowl. Seven receptions for 62 yards. I can live with that any day of the week. So what is it about – because Stingley in 2019 was fantastic. I'm looking at his numbers last night, or Sunday night rather, 21 uh, passes defended, six interceptions. He was also LSU's primary punt returner. So what about Stingley? What else, in addition to the statistics, makes him a better corner than Sauce Gardner? I think he's just more technically sound. If you want to like break down just the the X's and O's of the cornerback position, he doesn't draw as many penalties as Sauce Gardner. And I think that's one thing that's that's very important is drawing penalties. You can also look at, you know, their strengths of schedule in 2019 versus 2021. Of course, Cincinnati had some dogs on their schedule. Look at Notre Dame in the regular season and in the postseason as well, taking on some of the best teams in college football. Um, But Derek Stingley was able to do it more consistently against better SEC offenses. And I think technically wise, Derek Stingley is incredibly smooth. 
He is able to kind of deflect passes and really get up inside of a, of a receiver's head without drawing those same penalties. And I say that by saying Sauce Gardner is a dog. Sauce Gardner is an incredibly talented player. And whatever team is lucky enough to draft him is getting an incredibly good, very talented ball hawk type of player. I just think what I've seen from Derek Stingley is better than what I've seen from Sauce Gardner. But again, Derek Stingley hasn't done it for two years. Sauce Gardner did it this past season in a college football playoff berth. So that's that's a very impressive thing to me as well. But you ask why I think Derek Stingley is, is better outside of statistics. I think it's technically wise and what he's been able to do against uh, higher higher quality of opponents. So you think there is a merit to having done it in the SEC because LSU faced a lot of good teams in the SEC in 2019. And Sauce Gardner, I mentioned this on my on this podcast on Monday, Caroline. Sauce Gardner hasn't played top-notch competition as consistently as Stingley. So you're saying there is something to that. I do. I mean, if you look at um, the wide receivers traditionally taken uh, in the first round, a lot of times they come from SEC schools. I'm trying to think back to the, the 2020 season uh, or the 2020 draft of, you know, wide receivers taken in the first round. I'm not, I can't think of them off the top of my head. But, I mean, you look at last year, for example, Kadarius Tony against Florida. That's a team that LSU plays every single year. Jamison Williams, I believe that if he didn't come off of an ACL tear, he would probably be taken, um, if not the first wide receiver, probably taken in the top three of the wide receiver position. Of course, that's a team that Cincinnati went up against and Sauce Gardner played very well against in the postseason, but that's a team that LSU sees year in and year out. So when you're looking to, to draft NFL talent, you have to look and see who are they going up against? Is it going to be the kind of wide receivers that can't make it in the NFL? Or is he going up against wide receivers that we're going to see every Sunday in the fall? And in the SEC, they just have higher quality wide receivers that often get taken and in, you know are seen more on Sundays um, rather than some of the, the, the opponents that Cincinnati sees. And that's not to say that Cincinnati doesn't see some really good opponents because they do. LSU just sees more. Well, I, I was going to say, and, and I'll help you out there with some 2020 receivers. I mean, two coming from Alabama, Jerry Judy, Henry yeah. Rugg. And yep. then you go back to last year, uh, Jamar Chase, as you know, and I know, mm-hmm. um, Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith. I, I think the, all three of them went in the top 10. And by the way, Caroline, Derek Stingley Jr., you, I mean, look at who he went up against in practice for yeah. crying out loud at LSU. Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Terrace Marshall Jr. Oh, I could go on and on and on about that. So I, I, look, I, I, you make a lot of great points. I think both corners are going to be really good in the NFL. Because a cor- corners from the SEC have done remarkably well in the National Football League. So, do, I mean, I'll ask you this from an LSU perspective. You mentioned you haven't watched a lot of Bearcats football, and that's totally fine. Do you think Sauce Gardner is still going to have a good NFL career? That's really hard for me to say because I think that we, I think that the NFL draft is so incredibly unpredictable. But based off of what I've seen from Sauce Gardner, I have no reason to believe that he wouldn't have a very successful NFL career. Um, And and that depends on a lot of different factors. Whatever team ends up drafting him. I mean, we've seen it time and time again that a really talented player can get drafted by a team with either bad ownership, a turnover in coaching, turnover in coordinators. And it's unfortunate because we see a lot of really good talent get wasted um, by programs or teams that don't handle them correctly um so it's hard for me to say that he will or that he won't but based off of what i i've seen from sauce gardner based off of his statistics based off of what i know he can do barring any sort of circumstance i have no reason to believe that he wouldn't be incredibly successful in the nfl all right so coming up i'm going to ask you caroline about a certain quarterback you're very familiar with who desmond ritter recently compared himself to but first and because this is a live read i'm going to put these on so i can see or maybe just to look stylish. I don't know. And stylish but, you do look. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I ordered these for the draft because the NFL draft, of course, is on Thursday. But first, I got to tell you about our next partner. They have a product that I use literally every day. Maybe you do too, Caroline. Maybe those of you listening do as well. I started taking AG1 because, you know, I wanted more energy. I'm doing this podcast, which I love doing. In addition to working a full-time job, Caroline, you are too. Um, and I want to just, I don't like taking vitamins all that much, so I wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole foods, source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptive greens to help you start your day right. 
This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all of those things. So it's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. Tons of people take some kind of multivitamin, and it's important to choose one with high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. It costs you less than $3 a day, and you're investing in your health, and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop of water every day in a cup. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out at for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash college. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash college to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now time for a big announcement. For the first time ever, Locked On is hosting live coverage of the 2022 NFL Draft from our studios in Dallas with pick-by-pick analysis from our local team experts and draft gurus. Tune in all three days as your team draft guides, or your draft team, our draft team, rather, guides you through every pick and every trade in real time. It all starts Thursday, April 28th, this coming Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern time, available on Locked On NFL on YouTube and the Odyssey app. Potentially nine Bearcats going to be selected this week in the NFL draft. Alex Frank here with you. My guest today is the host of Locked On LSU, Caroline Fenton. And before we get to some Cincinnati LSU connections, Corey Kiner, Brian Kelly, I know Bearcats fans, but you're thinking maybe Caroline has a different opinion on him. So there's a quarterback, Caroline, who you're very familiar with. And I, I, when I say his name, if your co-host Jared Stillman is listening, he's going to go, oh, my Lord. But Desmond Ritter recently compared himself to Tennessee Titans quarterback Ryan Tannehill. By the way, if you didn't listen to Jared and Caroline the Monday after the Bengals beat the Titans in the divisional round, that is a great one hour of sports talk radio. I have listened to it twice. The day Thank it you. aired live. I appreciate that. And I just want to listen to sports talk one Saturday night here in Macon, Georgia, where I work. And I'm like, you know what? Let me go back and listen to that entertaining conversation. So if that's true. If Desmond Ritter compares himself to Ryan Tannehill, if that turns out to be, what does that look like for Desmond Ritter? So, first and foremost, I believe that so much around this time of year is a lot of of talk, a lot of politics. Um, Desmond Ritter has a lot of ties to the Tennessee Titans. Luke Fickle, for example, was Mike Rabel's best man in his wedding. They are best friends. They played together at Ohio State. Um, It has been rumored that the Tennessee Titans are considering taking a quarterback in the first round. Of course, Ryan Tannehill throwing three receptions in a playoff game against Cincinnati, a really lackluster season from Ryan Tannehill. A lot of games they won weren't because of him exactly, who day, Um, were because of him, but in spite of him, of some decision-making issues, um, accuracy concerns, uh, kind of like pre-calculating throws before the snap. And I think like we we heard that after the Cincinnati game that, you know, first snap, very first play of the game was an interception. First snap, Brian Tannehill eyes down Julio Jones. And if defenders can see that. So yep. every throw is pre-calculated. So, you know, that's, you know, Brian Tannehill's issue. We'll talk Tennessee Titans from 2 to 6 in Nashville. Um, I believe that Desmond Ritter may have said that to – show the Titans how interested he would be in the Tennessee Titans. Whoa. And knowing that the, the relationship that Luke Fickle has with Mike Rabel, um, the fact that the Titans could be fishing for a quarterback, the fact that it's incredibly likely that Desmond Ritter could be there available for the Titans at 26. Um, he's a name that we've talked a lot about on our show because you know Malik Willis, Kenny Pickett. We think that those quarterbacks would be out of reach for the Titans at 26. So Desmond Ritter emerged himself as a, a legitimate candidate if quarterback is the way that the, the Titans decide to go. So I find it very interesting that Desmond Ritter would compare himself to Ryan Tannehill because, you know, when you're coming into the draft, why would you compare yourself to an average quarterback when you could compare yourself to a Deshaun Watson or a Lamar Jackson. Of course, I think that Desmond Ritter has a better arm, better accuracy than Lamar Jackson, but looking at like incredibly mobile quarterbacks, that's who he could compare himself to. And he chose not to, he chose to compare himself to Ryan Tannehill, who, you know, that wouldn't necessarily always be a great thing. 
But you ask, you know, how would that turn out for him? I mean, Ryan Tannehill, he had two really solid seasons in Nashville in 2019, bringing them to the AFC Championship. Um, 2020 had one of the best offenses in the league. You know, of course, the, the playoff expectations fell short against a really talented Baltimore Ravens team. Um, but, I mean, Ryan Tannehill has done a ton of good for this team. I look at Ryan Tannehill as a little bit more of a game manager. And I say that, and that's not a knock on any. I think that game manager gets a lot of negative connotation. And I don't believe that that's a bad thing. I think that just means that you take care of the football and that you really play into the strengths of your supporting cast around you. I think that Desmond Ritter can play a, a larger role than more of a game manager role. I think that Desmond Ritter has such a strong arm and is really smart with his feet. And I think that that's how he's going to be able to find his success in the NFL rather than because, uh, you know, I think that, that Desmond Ritter does have, you know, some some accuracy issues. Um, I don't think that necessarily fits the role of a game manager, but I think that Desmond Ritter with his very strong arm and his, his ability to roll out and make plays on the go, I think that's what's going to make him very successful in the NFL rather than kind of playing into this Ryan Tannehill mold, who also is very good on his feet. He's really quick. He's an incredibly mobile quarterback. Actually played wide receiver in college with Texas A&M. So he's got the wheels, but I think that Desmond Ritter may have a stronger arm. Not only that, but Desmond Ritter hails from Louisville, which, as you know, is just a short three-hour drive up I-65. So he'd be playing yeah. close to home. And I was, re and I read that article that Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated wrote recently, and it talked about how, you, um, because I know there's also rumors that he could go to Pittsburgh, which I, of course, do yeah. not want that to happen as a Bengals fan. But I also would be happy for Des. But I read that it, it, you know it's important for where he goes for his family, his girlfriend, Claire, his daughter, Layton. I read about how they, all three of them and his friends and family spent three hours, Caroline, with Luke Fickle talking about, should he go pro? Because remember, he could have gone pro at the end of the 2020 season. He came yeah. back for the 2021 season. I, I feel like you just kind of broke some news here to, to me and maybe all of Cincinnati. See, I knew it was good to have you on today because I did not think that the Tennessee Titans would take a quarterback. And I've listened to your show with Jared a few times since the end, since the Bengals Titans game, and I haven't really heard talk about a quarterback. I, I, I've heard Jared mention it, uh -huh. but do you like if Desmond were to get drafted by Tennessee, which now huh, could happen? Would he would he start Week One? Would he start you know at some point in the regular season? Because I mean Ryan Tannehill, I mean I, I was high on him at. When the Titans were, I think, 5-0 in 2020, like, I was like, this guy is better than you think. He's a top-10 yeah. quarterback. All he has done since he got to Nashville was win. And then you look at what he's done recently and you go, eh, I don't know. So what would, if Desmond gets drafted by Tennessee, when does he start? Does he start? What happens? And just want to clear up, this is all speculation. No sort of news here, but, you know, in the offseason, that's what we do best is just speculate. So it's just speculation that the quarterback could be on the table for the Titans. This Titans team has so many holes that needs fixing. That's offensive line. That's wide receiver. The Titans don't have a second round pick, so they could be looking at it like, you know, we need a, 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 a positional role player to come in and start right away. And that's not what Desmond Ritter would be because he likely would not start game one. Um, I think that if they did draft Desmond Ritter or any other quarterback for that matter, and that's an if, um, that the, the plan would be for that quarterback to sit on the bench um, for at least the entire year, if not, you know, a majority of the season. So that quarterback can sit and learn and develop. Um, you know, Ryan Tannehill had a bad season. And the the backup option for the Titans right now is Logan Woodside. And I don't think, I know I don't, and I don't think a lot of Titans fans necessarily do feel comfortable about Logan Woodside coming in and taking that starting role if things do continue to go even further south with Ryan Tannehill. Um, you know, he's not a bad quarterback, but he's not a quarterback that can get you to the Super Bowl. And you look at all of these, you know, um, incredible players uh, for the Tennessee Titans right now. You're looking at A.J. Brown. You're looking at Derrick Henry. You know, they really were in a Super Bowl window. So you could think, you know, if, 
you know, if I'm Frank so Cannell sorry, my, my camera just turned off and my oh, uh, no, computer. That's okay. So that, we switched. Okay, so this continued. Okay, I'll edit that out. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're looking at the Titans are in a Super Bowl window and then you don't think that Ryan Tannehill is the quarterback to get you there, then you need to find the quarterback that's going to get you there and do it immediately. So he's not a, not a bad quarterback. He's just not the solution long term. But if they do draft Desmond Ritter, whatever quarterback they draft, if they do draft a quarterback, I believe the plan would be to sit them on the bench for the year, develop him for the year. If things go further south in Ryan Tana, with Ryan Tannehill, then perhaps that quarterback would go in. But I wouldn't see um, a newly drafted quarterback, if the, that's the decision, the, the route the Titans decide to go, I wouldn't see them starting until at least their year two. So just to confirm, there are only rumors – or is it true that Desmond Ritter is interested in the ten- playing for the Tennessee Titans? I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I haven't spoken with Desmond Ritter, but I wouldn't I wouldn't see why not. Like you mentioned, he's from Louisville. Um, he has a his coach Luke Fickle has a great relationship with Mike Vrabel. They're best friends. Um, so it just feels like an, an easy fit there. With um with Desmond Ritter, if he decide decide to come to Tennessee, I mean it's a very well run program. Um, no income tax, no state income tax in the state of Tennessee. So it you know, I'm sure he would be interested. If nothing else, at least the connection there at head coach with Mike Rabel and Luke Fickle. But I mean, I think that when you're sitting in that position, you got to take whoever you got to go with whoever drafts you. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears here because. LSU has a new head coach in football, Brian Kelly, who Mm -hmm. Bearcats fans are very familiar with. I mean, heck, Notre Dame fans are very familiar with him as well. Um, Cincinnati fans, I would say, mostly still do not like Brian Kelly, even though what Luke Fickle has done, for me at least, has made me forget about what happened with Brian Kelly. But let me ask you, because you're from LSU, you went to LSU, you host a daily LSU podcast. How do you feel about Brian Kelly? Do you like that he's the head coach? Are you excited? Are you kind of on the fence? And then how does Baton Rouge, the community of Baton Rouge and LSU, feel about Brian Kelly being their new football head coach? My personal feelings first. um, When they first made the hire, I was very surprised. I didn't think that that was a move that was even in the cards. It felt like a little bit of a mismatch to me, but also – Whenever you're coming off of a coach who was born and raised in Louisiana, um, you know, played football at LSU, whenever you move on from him, any person that fills that hole is probably going to feel like a little bit of a cultural mismatch. Um, But I went into it with an incredibly open mind. I didn't feel one way or another. I didn't feel super excited about it. I didn't feel super bummed about it. I just, you know, felt very, it was like a business decision to me. Um, But I think now that what we've seen from, from spring ball, and, and the culture that Brian Kelly has implemented, I think in the past, one of my biggest critiques of LSU, LSU coaching staff staffs is that it felt kind of um, jumbled, it felt a little outdated, and it felt like they stuck too much to the game plan that they initiated very early on. What I've seen from Brian Kelly is things seem very organized and very calculated. And this coaching staff, it's a brand new coaching staff coming in with a ton of a, a roster that's very, you know, mixed and matched and a lot of transfers coming in and older players coming in, transfers coming in and out. Um, So they aren't jumping to any conclusions of what they want this team to look like. They're going to let the talent and the players decide what the game plan is. Where in the past, I felt like there have been several coaching eras at LSU that have tried to fit the talent into a scheme, almost like a square peg in a round hole, and didn't really work. So I think that what I do appreciate from the Brian Kelly Kelly era so far is the way that he's been able to come in and really have a command over the locker room and a lot more calculated, almost like, um, I forgot who, who said this, but I read in an article that he's the CEO of practice. Um, and having that kind of control and command over the team is something that's new to us. And it's, I do really like, um, as you know, for Bat Rouge as a whole, LSU fans as a whole, I think that there be a little bit of, um, a bad taste in their mouths, maybe, about the way that he left Notre Dame, the way that Brian Kelly left Cincinnati, um, just kind of his attitude in the past. But I think overall, you know, at LSU, if you win, we don't care what you did in the past. We don't care who you are. If you win and you show results, that all that is all that matters. So I think we'll get our, our real decision on however we feel about Brian Kelly, you know, come September. It's that old adage, winning takes care of a lot of things. And 
I, I am interested in seeing how that works out down in LSU, but you're right, Caroline. The way he left Cincinnati, left a bad taste in a lot of mouths here in, uh, up in Clifton. The way he left Notre Dame, which, I mean, he, players found that on social media, which I, I thought was terrible. But it's a new it's a new day. It's a fresh start for Brian Kelly. I mean, you mentioned he's from Louisiana. We'll see how it works out. Um, let me ask you about Corey Kiner because I, I texted you last week. Thanks for sending them up here. I told him that we give him all the Skyline chili in the world. I know you don't like Skyline chili, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm always going to get on you for that, but that's okay. Gumbo over over Skyline. I, I, I do want to try gumbo, and my hope is, okay, because now there's rumors the Bengals and Saints are playing in London, which I hope doesn't happen because I want to go to the game in New Orleans. So if I do get to New Orleans, I'll be sure to try some gumbo. But Corey Kiner is coming home to eat chili in mm -hmm. Cincinnati. Um, what can you tell Bearcats fans about what they can expect from a four-star running back who is from the Queen City? Yeah, well, first and foremost, whenever Corey Kiner decided to transfer and then he came out like almost like five minutes later and said he was going to Cincinnati, I think he had his mind made up um, much earlier than when he decided to transfer. I'm excited for him. That's where he's from. He's going to be just a hop and a skip from where he grew up. His mom can come watch him play football. So I'm incredibly excited for Corey Kiner. Um, looking at it from a, a, a football standpoint, I thought that Corey Kiner was really going to come up and stand up and be the number one spot at running back. He was behind Tyrion Davis Price this past season, who really got that running back one position. Um, but Corey Kenner is an incredibly explosive runner. He's the kind of guy who doesn't want to go down, and we saw that a lot. We don't, you know, we don't, we didn't see a ton of Corey Kenner this past season just because he was in that running back two role. Uh, but he's incredibly explosive. He doesn't want to go down. He has a really good build, um, a good running back build. He's small enough that he's able to kind of be super agile, but big enough that he can be physical against defenders. Um, so I. Nothing but wish nothing but the best for him. Uh, but I think that he saw a very stacked running back room at LSU and said, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to get my shot here. So why not go home? Um, so excited for him and really excited for Cincinnati fans to see the way that he runs. Yeah, I'm definitely excited when you have a four star running back and a four star quarterback potentially in your starting lineup next year if you're Cincinnati. And they both won Mr. Football in the state of Ohio, which is a football hotbed in one of yeah. the top six or seven states in the country for high school football. So coming up, Caroline, to wrap up the show, I'm going to ask you a question about the basketball program at LSU because I noticed a few weeks ago that it was in a state of turmoil, but I can relate. Cincinnati can relate because last year the Bearcats were somewhat in a similar situation. So we'll get into that next, but first I need to tell everybody about betonline.net, your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. You can find all of the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the Major League Baseball season. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sporting, wagering information from live betting to the playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Locked on LSU host Caroline Fenton, my guest on today's episode of Locked On Bearcat. She's also the co-host of Stillman and Company on ESPN 1025 The Game, Nashville's best sports talk. You can follow her on Twitter at Caroline Fenton. One, she's a proud LSU alum, but um, the men's basketball program, which has been a successful program in recent years, Caroline. Yeah. Um, can you update us on how many scholarship players are there currently on the roster? Because what a few, a few weeks ago there were zero scholarship players. Is that right? Um, yes, every scholarship player on the LSU's roster decided to leave. Um, so while I expected that, because for so many reasons, you know, LSU could be staring down the barrel of crippling NCAA sanctions. Um, the coach who recruited him to LSU was no longer there. So for those two reasons, I expected plenty of players to want to leave, you know, get a fresh start elsewhere, go somewhere where the postseason would feel like a little bit more of a, of a sure thing and go somewhere with a coach that wants them there. Um, I totally get it. Um, but that definitely did leave this LSU basketball program in a little bit of turmoil. Um, it's, it, it will be very interesting moving forward to see what the LSU basketball team does. But in this new era, um, I mean, plenty of Murray State players decided to transfer to LSU, kind of go with their coaching staff there. So that's a huge testament to this new LSU basketball coaching staff. But um, wasn't really expecting that many players to transfer, but they did. So um, don't blame them whatsoever. But it definitely will be an interesting offseason for LSU basketball. That is for certain. 
Because I just remember at the end of the 2021 season, Cincinnati, their head coach, um, there were tons of allegations against him. You had players left and right transferring. I think when the new coach was hired, there were maybe four or five scholarship players on the roster. And it's a very unnerving, unsettling feeling, especially for a fan, because Cincinnati, before that head coach, John Brandon, was here, was one of the most consistent programs in the entire country. Nine straight NCAA tournaments, you weren't used to turmoil. So what's it like when something like that happens to a program? Because the way I saw it, when I saw there were zero scholarship players, I'm like, is this going to be a 30 for 30 someday? Honestly, maybe. I mean, the, the, the drama surrounding LSU basketball has been there for so long. Since, you know, trending back to 2017. Um, all with the FBI wiretaps and the phone calls and the the money wiring to coaches and, or to, excuse me to players and players fiancés and family members and getting you know parents of players jobs um, and even throw in the football program as well you know Odell Beckham Jr. Give, handing out cash to players after the national championship I mean LSU has been facing a lot of NCAA violations um, you know we'll take the football program out of this but it's incredibly unsettling just to not know the uncertainty of what's to come for this basketball program, I think is the biggest thing for me. What's done is done. And, you know, we can't go back and, you know, change what has been done. I personally, I wouldn't do it if I could. The Will Wade era was very fun. Um, before Will Wade, there was just not a lot of buy-in to the basketball program, and he really just breathed life into it. It was so energetic and so exciting under Will Wade, um, and LSU found a lot of success under Will Wade, so I wouldn't take it back, um, but it is incredibly unnerving knowing what could or could not come down the pipe for LSU basketball and the sanctions that could they could be facing um, because the allegations are really bad. It looks really bad. Um the way that Will Wade, just not not just what he did, but also his refusal to cooperate with the NCAA, his refusal to come forward with evidence, it's not a good look. Um, so it's unnerving. Um, but I believe with Matt McMahon and his coaching staff, this team is you know in good hands. All in on a positive, what is the best gumbo chili place? Or I'm sorry, that's redundant. What is the best gumbo place in Baton Rouge or New Orleans? Oh, that's a really tough one. Really tough one because there are so many great places. Um, one of my favorites is Tony Seafood in Baton Rouge. Um, I mean, everything there is great. They've got gumbo, um, you know, crawfish etouffee, fried catfish. Uh, it's one of my absolute favorite places in Baton Rouge and where I bring anyone who comes to, to Baton Rouge. And also Chimes is one of my favorite places. It's right off of LSU's campus. Um, they've got great Cajun food, a really great beer selection, and just like a really fun place to hang out. So I would say Tony Seafood and Chimes are my two go-tos. I'll also ask you this. I recently listened to an interview with Leo Frost. Who's Leo Frost? For those who don't know, he is Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase's jeweler. And it was, yeah. a, pheno it was a phenomenal interview. Um, were, were Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase um, fashionistas or fashion uh, icons at LSU? <laughs> because what they're doing up here in Cincinnati is remarkable. Were they like that when they were at LSU? So Jamar Chase, yeah, Jamar Chase had a good bit of swag to him in college, but it was like an ongoing joke with Joe Burrow that he wore the same hoodie for every single media availability in 2019. He wore his 2018 um, Fiesta Bowl sweatshirt all the time, all the time. He would wear like Looney Tunes shirts and SpongeBob shirts. So Joe Burrow in college, no, did not have the same kind of swag, the same Joe Shiesty style that he has now. I'm sure the uh, the millions that he's making in the NFL definitely doesn't hurt his uh, his fashion sense. But it was it's funny you ask that because it was almost like an ongoing joke at LSU among um, reporters and people who covered LSU that Joe Burrow wore the same sweatshirt every day. <laughs> I would never have thought that. Yeah, I, I the fashionista and style icon that he is today, you wouldn't have thought that, but. Yeah, humble beginnings, I guess. Is Jamar Chase as funny as people say he is? 
he is, they both are. I mean, Jamar Chase has such a, like an electric, like electricity about him. He has such a fun and upbeat personality that he's the kind of guy that you just, you know, you want to be around. He's the kind of guy that you just want to talk to. Um, and I think Joe Burrow as well. You see it kind of in his personality and on the on his play that like he's equally playful and goofy as he is serious. I mean, he is he can command a room better than anyone else I've ever seen. But he also has this almost like childlike playfulness to him. You know, he loves SpongeBob. You know, he loves cartoons. Um, so he's goofy and very meany, but also has that control over people. So both of them are just really fun, um, uh, magnetic people to be around. How about that? Good questions to end on. Caroline Fenton locked down LSU on today's show. Special guest, uh, you can also hear her on Stillman & Company, ESPN, 1025 The Game, Nashville's Best Sports Talk, 3 to 7 Eastern, 2 to 6 Central Time, weekdays. She's also the co-host, as I mentioned, of Locked On LSU, proud LSU alum. Caroline, thank you, as always, for your time talking about Stingley's Jr. versus Sauce Gardner, uh, talking about Corey Kiner, Desmond Ritter, comparing himself to Brian Tannehill, which now apparently we know that Desmond Ritter could be heading to Nashville, which – I would be all in on. I mean, heck, I'm. If there's a way to be at two games at one time, I go to the Bengals games on Sunday, and then somehow, you know, maybe half of me be in Nashville to watch Desmond Ritter play. I think you and me possible. both would would agree with that. <laughs> if that's possible, Caroline Fenton, thank you so much for your time and uh, best wishes going forward. And I look forward to crossing paths with you, especially during football season, because the Bengals are in Nashville next year. So I do plan on being at that game once again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Let me know when you're in Nashville. I'll show you around. Absolutely. Caroline Fenton, the host of Lockdown LSU. Apologies for my uh, camera going out earlier. I hit the power button on my computer trying to get my notes. Anyway, that's going to do it for me, Lockdown Bearcats. Thanks for making it your first listen every day. Don't forget, you can follow me on Twitter at Cranky underscore 90 with two N's and N-A-T-I. You can follow me on Instagram, AlexFrank9 underscore, or email me at Alex3Frank at gmail.com. Thanks for making it your first listen every day, Lockdown Bearcats. Now go make your second listen, Lockdown NFL Draft, Ryan Tracy. And former NFL cornerback Eric Crocker bring the NFL draft to life every day with insight and analysis on college football prospects and NFL front offices. It is free and available everywhere you get your podcasts. Efforting some guests potentially for tomorrow, but remember Thursday, Russ Heltman joins me. Friday, John Garcia Jr. joins me. So, so much left to get to. Um, more on where Desmond Ritter might be headed, where Sauce Gardner might be headed. So much happening this week. It's draft week, and thank you for being a part of it. For Locked On Bearcats, I'm Alex Frank. Thank you for listening, and have a great rest of your Tuesday. Special thanks to Caroline Fenton for joining, and thank you for listening. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, and we will talk to you. I will talk to you tomorrow.